So today, in the next few weeks, we'll be discussing the um, masters um, of our path. Last week, we looked at um, Paramahansa Yogananda, our guru. It's this picture here. And today, we'll um, talk about Babaji. Um, Babaji is the, for those who don't know, it's the second picture on the altar. It's actually a painting. Babaji um, lives quite, well, his life is quite extraordinary. Um, some of the lives of the other masters is in some ways ordinary, like when you look at the life of Lahiri Mahashaya, which is the first picture on the altar. His life was very ordinary. He was a government accountant. And uh, he was a householder. He had two children. But Babaji's life is so far from that. Extraordinary in that Yogananda says he's been living for centuries, perhaps millenniums. He's also known as the deathless master. He has a small band of disciples. He lives in the Himalayan mountains. And in that small band of disciples, two of the disciples are American disciples. And you know, I've often contemplated, whenever I read or hear that two of the disciples were American disciples, I kind of contemplate, who could they be? And one person that comes to mind is actually um, Rajasi Janakananda. Rajasi Janakananda was a... Um, one of the early disciples of Yogananda while Yogananda was still alive. And um, he became the president of the organization after Yogananda passed away. So, um, and he experienced samadhi, which is the ultimate enlightenment, on the very first day that he practiced Kriya Yoga. As in, he would already have been a advanced disciple at that stage. And so I won't be surprised if Rajasi Janakananda is one of the American disciples of Babaji, who's part of his small band who lives in the Himalayan mountains. Um, the second one, I don't quite know. I've wondered if it's Sister Gyanamata. But then I've also thought, would he have a woman disciple living in the Himalayan mountains? Perhaps. I don't know. I don't want to be uh, sexist, you know. <laughs> but I don't know who the second one is. But perhaps, you know, um, as you start contemplating that too, you might have some intuition uh, who that might be. And the other thing it says that's quite extraordinary is... Um, Sometimes he travels from peak to peak, like how ordinary folks would travel. But at other times, they just do astral traveling. As in, wherever they want to be, they just suddenly just appear there. And um, I read this book um, where all these stories are told over 30 years ago, and I've kind of just come to accept all of this. Um, I don't question it in some ways. But the rational mind, the cognitive mind, cannot comprehend, like, is this some kind of a fiction? Um, Babaji has a sister called Mataji. And Babaji lives high up on the Himalayan mountains, but Mataji lives in an underground cave. I mean, what a contrast. She lives in an underground cave, and the way that Babaji has come to um, live for so long, the story that's told here is that one of Lahiri Mahashaya, 
um, disciple was uh, sent to this Dasa Samed Ghat. Ghat means a place by the river. So Lahiri Mahashaya sends this disciple known as Ram Gopal Muzumdar to this um, Ghat and he goes there and then there is this stone slab that suddenly opens and from that levitates Babaji's sister, Mataji. She levitates high up in the air and then she comes back down. And Ram Gopal is experiencing this um, whole thing unfolding right in front of his eyes. And then he looks and there's this dazzling light coming along the river and that happens to be Lahiri Mahashaya and then another floating light comes and there there's Babaji. And Mataji is, um, I think Babaji is wanting to leave his body and he says to Mataji that, you know, um, uh, Mataji says for him to stay in this body and Babaji says, you know, it makes no difference to me if I stay in this body or if I don't stay in this body. And Mataji, with a little bit of wit, says, well, if it makes no difference to you, then you stay in this body. And Babaji says, well, God has spoken through you. I will stay. And so he, at that time, um, has promised to stay in his physical body for this whole world cycle. I don't fully understand what it means that he will stay in the physical body for this whole world cycle, but I assume it's the 24,000 year cycle that Sri Yukteswar talks about, but I don't quite really know. It's, you know, on this path, we have been given so much that we can be intrigued by, so much that we can contemplate, so much that we can get excited about, we can meditate about. There's just no end. Or you could think of it as a conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> that there is this Babaji who lives in the Himalayan mountains and his mission is to train prophets and so um, Lahiri Mahashaya, whom he gave the technique of Kriya Yoga, is not the only master that he has trained. There are many others because that is his mission. And so we are not sectarian. In say, we don't say that this is the only way, you know, to get to enlightenment or go, get to infinite consciousness. Babaji's role is to train prophets. And um, I was thinking of a worldly analogy that would kind of describe the kind of position that Babaji holds. And first I thought CEO, but then I thought, no, that's not quite the right analogy because a CEO doesn't necessarily own the organization, right? So um, I don't know if anybody else has got some name that would... Uh, like a supreme commander? <laughs> Would that describe? It's got to be something spiritual, doesn't it? A spiritual guide or another word like guide. Maybe. But you know, he's so much more than a guide because mm -hmm. uh, he's basically in charge of this work. Mm -hmm. Through him, we have got Paramahansa Yogananda. Through him, Kriya Yoga came out into this world at least for this lineage. In fact, when, um, so the mission that Paramahansa Yogananda was given was to um, 
show the parallels between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Krishna, as in to bring the East and West together. And when we pray, we also say, you know, saints of all religions. And so sometimes um, people would ask, so you say you know that you accept all religions, but then at the same time you only talk about the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Krishna. Why not the teachings of Judaism? Why not the teachings of Buddha? And Yogananda's answer was actually very simple. He says, that's the will of Babaji. So he never got into any heady, rational conversations, as in, that's what Babaji wanted me to do. As in, we always refer back to Babaji. And when Yogananda was going to America in 1920, um... He prayed really hard, as in like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? And when he was praying, he said he prayed so hard, tears were rolling down his eyes and he couldn't really pray anymore. His head was kind of cracking. And um, a um, sadhu appears in his attic where he was sitting down praying, who happens to be Babaji, as in Babaji appears to Yogananda. And he says to Yogananda that, yes, do go to America and take this teaching. So time and time again, we see that it's Babaji who's the cosmic director If you think of all of this as like a movie, he is the director of this movie. He wrote the whole script. And we are just, you know, actors in Babaji's script. When um, Sri Yukteswar is at the Kumbha Mela. Kumbha Mela is a spiritual gathering that happens in the city of Allahabad in India. And it happens once every 12 years. Millions of people go to that gathering. And that's the place where all the um, saints, sages, the hermits all come to bless the people. And when Sri Yukteswar, this is Yogananda's guru, when he was there in the year 1895, or it might have been 1894, I kind of always get it wrong. 1895 was when Lahiri Mahasha passed away. So I think this was 1894. See you, Shelley. Um, Lahiri Mahasha, um, sorry, Sri Yukteswar is at this gathering and he's looking around and it's just noisy. It was just um, a lot of chaos going on. A friend of mine who lives in Wellington attended this um, gathering and he said that um, when you are there, all you really want to do is just get out of the place. It's just, I mean, you can imagine the whole logistics it's a um, 160 kilometers in length. Usually this area is all covered in water because that's where the Ganges River flows. And the period where the place is dry appears a pop-up city. And imagine the logistics of having a shower. Well, there are no showers. People just go and take a dip in the river. Um, BBC has done a documentary which is on YouTube if you are interested in um, to find out a bit more. Of course, it's kind of done for a popular audience, so um, you've kind of got to take it with a bit of a grain of salt there. But still, you know, um, it gives you some idea 
of what that gathering is like. And BBC documentary, which was done, I think sometime in the 1990s, at that point they say about 100 million people go to this gathering. And these gatherings still happen. They still happen. Kumba Mela, K-U-M-B-H-A. Absolutely crazy. And so Sri Yukteswar is at this mela. Mela means gathering. He's at this mela and he's just kind of looking at around him and all this. It's like an assault to your senses. And he's thinking to himself that surely the Western scientists are more pleasing to God than all these people, you know, who kind of um, make out that they are holy and saintly and they are here with a begging bowl, like, what's going on here? And um, the word that Yogananda uses in this autobiography is um, social reform, as in Babaji saw that Sri Yukteswar was interested in social reform and Babaji was there at the Kumbha Mela and a man um, appears in front of Sri Yukteswar just as he is having these thoughts of social reform and says that there is a man sit, um, standing under a tree who wants to speak to you. And of course, Sri Yukteswar was a little bit bewildered, like who in this place would want to see me? So Sri Yukteswar goes there under a tree and it happens to be Babaji. And um, Babaji at that point calls him by the name of Swami. Swami means a renunciate. And Sri Yukteswar says, I'm not a Swami. And Babaji says, on those who, on whom I bestow this um, title, kind of accept it. And um, then there's a little conversation that happens and Babaji says to him that I see that your heart is open <coughs> to um, both the East and the West. He says, I will send you a disciple who you will train who will take the teachings of Kriya Yoga to the West. Now, if I've got my dates right in my head, um, then this is happening when Paramahansa Yogananda is just a year old. Yogananda was born in 1893, and this conversation between Babaji and Sri Yukteswar is happening in 1894. And Yogananda meets Babaji when he was 17 years old. And when Babaji is telling the story to Paramahansa Yogananda in response to, because it was a evening just like it is today, Sri Yukteswar and Yogananda are sitting on a balcony. It was a cool summer evening, so it says in the autobiography. And Yogananda asks his guru, did you ever meet Babaji? And that's when Sri Yukteswar tells the story of how he meets Babaji at this Kumbha Mela, the spiritual gathering. And then he says to Yogananda, and you are the one that Babaji promised to send me. As in, as you can see, it always goes back to Babaji. And what is kind of um, quite not quite sure what's the right word, um, but it says that anybody who utters the name of Babaji with reverence attracts his instant blessing. Isn't that beautiful? 
Anybody who utters the name of Babaji with reverence attracts his instant blessing. So, with reverence is the key because we can say the name of Babaji kind of absent-mindedly too, right? Um, there's a story, once again, in this book. There are lots of stories about Babaji, you know, when you look for it. Um, so Babaji had promised um, Lahiri Mahashaya that... I will come whenever you call me. So this is happening in the Himalayan mountains when Babaji had told this to his disciple Lahiri. And then when Lahiri is going back from the Himalayan mountains back to his home, which is about 800 kilometers away, the distance between like Whangarei and Wellington, and in a horse and, uh, sorry, was it bullock cart, I think, Bullock cat. He's going back and he stops on the way at a friend's place. And these friends are um, kind of complaining that these days there are no saints living in India. And they are saying this to Lahiri, who has just met Babaji. And um, Lahiri says, Oh no, I've just met a saint in the Himalayan mountains, and he starts telling the story about Babaji. And I imagine that he probably told the story about the golden palace that Babaji materializes in the Himalayan mountains and um, how he gave him Kriya Yoga and the conversation that happened between Babaji and Lahiri Mahashaya. And of course, these um, friends don't believe him. I mean, you imagine... If somebody starts telling you a story like this, you know, oh, I met this saint in the mountains and he materialized a golden palace and it had all these jewels in, in it. And when I was hungry, he just instantly manifested food. I mean, it would sound like a, you know, like maybe you're schizophrenic or um, you're making this up or you're dreaming or you are delusional. So the friends thought that, hey, spending time in the Himalayan is kind of, you know, um, made you a little bit delusional. And so he says to his friends, you know, I can show you that if I call Babaji, he will come. And he says to his friends, he says, um, give me a room, you know, where I can go to, where I can call Babaji. So they take him to this room. He asks for two woolen blankets. They give him these two beautiful woolen blankets and he goes into this closed room and he calls Babaji. <laughs> Babaji appears. All the doors are closed. Babaji appears in this room and Babaji is a little bit disappointed. He says, Lahiri, you call me for a trifle? He says, anybody who sees, of course they will believe. But when it comes to deep truths, people have to experience it in, through their faith. He says, let me go. Imagine, Babaji, if he wanted to, he could dematerialize himself. But he's asking for permission from his disciple to let me go. And then Lahiri says that, hey, you know, I want you to bless my friends. Um, if they see you, they will believe you. And then Babaji kind of, you know, um, says that, well, I don't want to disappoint. Um, I don't want you to look bad. These are my words. I don't want you to look bad in front of your friends. So, okay, I will bless them. And so they open the door and they let the friends come. And 
Babaji is just sitting there, just like we all are sitting here. And um, Babaji says, you know, he gives each one a blessing and then he says, make some halwa. Halwa is a sweet um, dish. Babaji actually doesn't eat usually. You see, even though he lives in this physical body, he is not governed by the rules that operate in this world. So he's in this world, but not of this world. And so they prepare some um, sweet dish, they sit around, they share it, and then um, Babaji leaves. But before he leaves, he tells Lahiri in no uncertain terms, from now, excuse me, from now on, I will come not when you want me, but I will come when you need me. So what that kind of tells me is that just because we utter the name of Babaji doesn't mean he will come. But when he really knows that we need him, he will come. You know, some things are just too big for us to solve on our own. And for problems that are too big, Babaji is the one to call. Because most often when the problems are too big, we are only experiencing a small part of it, just like that story of that elephant um, and that man who had that six blind sons, you know, and they were each touching some part of the elephant and each one thought that an elephant, one thought that elephant is like a pole because they were experiencing the legs of the elephant. One thought that elephant is like a wall because they were, you know, um, feeling the body of the elephant. One thought that the elephant is like a fan because they were touching the ears of the elephant. And likewise, when something is too big, like what's happening in the world right now, it's just so big that all of us are experiencing just a small part of what is happening because it's just too big for us. And so what do we do? Babaji, please help. Please help me to understand what's going on. Please help me to surrender to your will. Help me to be an instrument because these great masters, they need instruments to do their work in this world. And we can be their instruments. But what do we have to do? We have to attune our will to their will. Most often what it is that we do, we just want to do what we want to do. And this attunement takes a bit of effort. We have to withdraw our senses inwards. In fact, that's what Kriya Yoga is. Kriya Yoga is, uh, Yogananda calls um, the senses, the sense telephones. He says the te sense telephones are constantly ringing and our energy is constantly moving out. The world is always an exciting place. But to really be able to tune in to what the great masters want us to do, we've got to actually disconnect the sense telephones. This is the phrase that Yogananda uses. Disconnect the sense telephones. Put our awareness within in that astral spine and lift it up to the point between the eyebrows 
and in that uplifted consciousness, in that inner silence, we may hear the whispers that are... The great ones are always talking to us, but we don't hear it because our mind is very noisy. And so through these techniques of meditation that we have been given, we learn to quieten the mind, we learn to quieten our hearts so that we can become instruments of these great ones. And then when we utter the name of Babaji with reverence, he can come to us. He's omnipresent. What does omnipresence mean? They can be everywhere at once. The disciples are dear to them. You know, in um, I've got several competing thoughts happening in my mind. Um, Babaji is actually a reincarnation of Krishna. When Paramahansa Yogananda prayed, and this is how we pray here, that when we take the names of these great masters, we say Babaji Krishna, because Babaji really is an incarnation of Krishna. And so, and um, Yogananda is a, uh, used to be Arjuna, Arjuna was a disciple of Krishna during the time of the Mahabharat, which happened, um, I don't know, about 900 BC or somewhere around there. Um, but when Jesus was born, Swami Kriyananda has also said that uh, Paramahansa Yogananda used to be Jesus. And um, Marshall um, has often told me that when you lived in UK, Marshall, when he was very young, in his 20s, he used to go to this meditation group which was based on the teachings of these masters. And the lady who used to run the meditation group, she had actually met Yogananda in person. Because Yogananda only passed away in 1952. So obviously there are people alive who have met him. And that lady used to say that, oh, he was Jesus, he was Jesus. We don't say this too publicly. Um, uh, but yeah, if Yogananda was Jesus, and then he said that when Jesus was born, the three wise men who appeared to Jesus were actually Sri Yukteswar, Babaji, and Lahiri Mahashaya. And you know the scriptures tell us that the great ones come into this world again and again and again. So if you look at it from that perspective, it makes sense that the same line of masters have come in many different forms many dif at many times. In the time of the Mahabharat, Krishna and Arjuna. In the time of Jesus, you know, Yogananda and the same masters again. And this line of masters, it's like there are many masters in this world. And each line of masters have got their own different missions. This line of in different parts of the world often, but this line of masters, it appears that they have a world mission. And at this time, it's like to bring the East and the West together. And that's why there's so much about that written in this book. It says, Babaji is well aware 
of the trend of modern times and the influence and complexities of Western civilization. Imagine that. Yogananda wrote this book in 1946. That was when it was published. And at that time, he's talking about Babaji being aware of the influence and complexities of Western civilization. And we are only just kind of experiencing this in a kind of a exaggerated form right now. That how quickly democracies can kind of collapse. I'm not saying it has collapsed, but it's kind of wanting to happen. So, and Babaji works in, and in the words of Yogananda, in humble obscurity, as in you will never read in the newspapers that, oh, there is this man who lives in the Himalayan mountains who has got it all under control. So they work away from the public gaze because the consciousness of the world uh, kind of doesn't allow this consciousness to exist at the same time. In fact, even if he did walk in the streets, people would not recognize that here is a great master who's walking in the streets. He'll look like just some, you know, ordinary person. I don't think he'll even be dressed any differently. So Babaji is well aware of what's going on. And it says that Babaji and Jesus, Babaji from the East, Jesus from the West, are in direct communion with each other. And that in itself is something to contemplate. As in, what are they doing? Are they actually sitting together in a cave in the Himalayan mountains and they're discussing? So what shall we do next? This is what's happening in the world. There's a pandemic going on. What shall we do? I mean, what are they discussing? Are they just discussing telepathically? Who knows? But it says that they are in direct communion with each other. And they have planned the technique of salvation for this age. Do you think we have anything to worry about? And when Babaji has, gives the technique of Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga is a very powerful meditation technique uh, that burns up all our karma and helps to uplift our consciousness so that we too can become part of that small band of disciples that Babaji moves around with. His life shows us our potential. His life was not meant to be a life that, ooh, Babaji's there and I am here, a place that I can never reach. But Babaji has got to where he is through all the stages that we are going through in our own lives. It's not like that he suddenly descended as a perfect being in this world. And so his life serves to tell us what our potential is. That we too can live in this world and not be affected by everything that's going on in this world. Master says to live, you can be um, what's the uh, phrase he uses? Um, 
in the midst of crashing world, something like that. I, um, when you sit in the, stand unshaken in the midst of crashing worlds. And in fact, that's what Kriya Yoga does to us. Kriya Yoga centers our energy so that all these things can be going on around us, but we can stand unshaken. Um, when Babaji gives the technique of Kriya Yoga to um, Lahiri Mahashaya, he tells him that when you give this technique to others and give it to all who ask for it, he says, repeat to them these words from the Bhagavad Gita. Even a little practice of this inward religion will free you from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And recently, I have contemplated those words a lot. As in, Babaji did not say that practice these techniques and everything in your life will be comfortable and pleasurable, that you will attain full enlightenment. No, he didn't say any of that. Maybe he knew that we were going to go through some really tough times, hard times. And so the technique that he brought us is just the perfect technique that will free us from dire fears and colossal sufferings. All we need to do is practice Kriya Yoga and utter the name of Babaji with reverence and we will attract to ourselves an instant blessing. So that's all I had for you for you today unless anybody has any thoughts or comments or questions you've written a poem Alexandra yes you did you did I'm going to have to read it again Oh, from today. Okay. I'll check my phone later. Alexandra seems to be very good at writing poems. And she writes it while we're having all this discussion. So if nobody else had anything to say, maybe we can finish with a closing prayer. So um, as we invoke the presence of the masters, do so with reverence so that we can attract the blessings, especially of Babaji today. Heavenly Father, Father, Divine Mother, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Lahiri Mahashaya Swami Sri Yukteswar, Swami Yukteswar and, Paramahansa and Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, of all religions and our friend and guide Swami Kriyananda. We humbly bow at your feet. May thy love shine forever. On the, sanctuary of our devotion. on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken. And may we be able to awaken. Thy love in all hearts. Thy love in all hearts. Om. Om. Peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Um, we've got a Sunday service organized for the 23rd of January. Um, we thought we better get that going. So that's Sunday, 23rd at 10 a.m. for those who would like to come to that. 
the Sunday services are more kind of um, devotional. Um, there's usually a scripture reading from the Gita, from the Bible. Um, there's a small purification ceremony. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. So if you want to come to that, that's on the 23rd. Um, I'll also send some information out to um, the people who come to this Wednesday meetings about our um, um, retreat um, in March. It's the 4th, 5th, 6th of March. And uh, for all technical, legal purposes, it's a gathering to celebrate the Mahasamadhi of Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, we've got three Airbnb places in Rotorua. So obviously, there's only so much room. Um, but I think we can take about, how many did we say about? 16, 18 max, if a few people uh, have mattresses in their car. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Prices, prices similar to uh, we haven't yeah. worked that out yet, but um, we'll, so. we'll, is it going to be similar, you think? Yeah. Julian's putting a lot of effort into organizing that. Um, we, we're hoping it's going to be very similar here. Um, was there anything else I needed to know? Could you give a time for the Sunday service? Could you say it's, it's, it's at 10 o'clock, yeah. People just forget the most important part, they shared lunch. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> On Sunday we have a shared lunch, so if you're coming to it, we um, just bring a plate of vegetarian food to share. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah.